Hello, and welcome to Skills to Pay the Bills. I'm your host, Tia Young, and today we are continuing on to part two of our series on risk management strategies for the small business owner and their families. Our panelists are Shirley Liu, Executive Field Chairman for First Financial Security, and Anthony Ruiz, Assistant District Director, 8A Business Development. We also honor to have in the studio small business owners and community observers from the Washington metropolitan area. I thank the panelists uh, each as well as the business owners and the community observers for taking the time out of their busy schedules to be in the studio with us today. We're going to start the ball rolling with Anthony Ruiz. Anthony, would you just give us a brief summary of what we talked about in part one? Anytime someone's planning to start a business, we urge them, plan. But start with you, the person that wants to start the business, and truly do a self-assessment. And uh, is this right for you, and are you ready? And then a comprehensive business plan, as well as a strategic plan. Where do you want to take this business five years from now? And don't do it alone. And the federal government, the SBA, has many resources to help the budding entrepreneur through the Small Business Development Center, the Women's Business Center, and the Service Corps of Retired Executives. Very good. Thank you. Shirley? Well, very simple. If Whether you're in business or individual, I recommend you do these three things. First, consider this. What if I live too long? Do I have retirement? And if, what if I die too soon? Do I have coverage to cover my business and my family? And in between living too long and dying too soon, what if I get sick, disabled, any of those things could happen to you? Make sure your financial planning cover all three bases. Very good, thank you. And now we're going to get into some questions and answers. These people look like they really got questions on their minds. So we're gonna get started. And uh, Ed, I think we'll start with you. Uh, Ed Richardson, uh, Trudy's Mambo Sauce. And my question is, how do you get self-certified? What is the process to get self-certified as a minority woman business? You go to SAM.gov, and within SAM.gov, the central contractor registration, and fill in all the basic information about the business and the individual starting that business, and then check off, are you a woman? And, uh, and then after that, in Oracle, with, you could navigate the website very easily, and now you are self-certified as a woman-owned small business. But keep the documents that they asked you about on hand in the event when you bid on a contract and the agency asks to authenticate that information, you have all that information handy. So Anthony, uh, let me make sure I heard you right. Are you saying that we could go on the uh, internet tonight and fill this form out and be certified? Yes. It, you're not waiting uh, three weeks or three months for, wow. You can start your business today and be self-certified as a WSB, provided you're a woman, only 51% and, and controlling that company. Wow, that's uh, impressive. Obviously, I'm not a woman, but <laughs> I work for, I'm a minority partner in a woman-owned business. That's why I wanted to ask that We want that to question. make it easy. <laughs> wow. Our next question. Hi, my name is Natalie Hall. I'm a business color, you pretty. Uh, my question is, what's the number one cause that would make a business go under? And should you have a mentor if you're just starting? Lack of planning. Hmm. Many people think it's financing. Many people think it's the economy. Many people think it's, I didn't get enough revenues. No, lack of planning and preparation. When you say lack of, of planning and, and, and preparation, what is that? What is that entailing? Is that you know getting your vision and putting it, writing it down, and what all, what all is included in that? One is a self analysis. Okay. The individual, for example, individual might be a techie, and that individual's been IT industry, high achiever in a company, and decided you know what I can do this on my own, and make more money, but that individual was in a technical capacity. And so they're a super brainy individual on the technology side, but that individual may have actually very poor interpersonal skills, mm. or that individual may or never have sold. 
And, and in our society, communication comes at a prime. And so what are the communication skills of that individual? And so that individual, that may be a weakness of that individual as well. And then to properly capitalize that business, the individual may not have enough credit or collateral to obtain initial financing to get that business started. In addition to that, that individual may have poor management skills. He or she was always working alone in a company, and now that individual has to hire a staff, and, and they're very weak in the area of management skills and directing and motivating uh, individuals to perform on the, on the job. And so there's a multitude of variables that one has to consider that are all part of planning and preparation. Very good. Next question. Hi, I'm Benjamin Laster and um, involved with several small businesses, uh, primarily fast food and a number of other undertakings for the last 35, 40 years. My question is a two-part question, one directed towards Shirley and the other to Anthony. Uh, first of all, um, Shirley, you mentioned that there was a possibility of living too long or dying too soon. The living too long part, uh, you know, that. That escapes me. Dying too soon, I can understand. <laughs> <laughs> How do you live too long? Well, living too long, a lot, uh, the biggest problem I see today is uh, a lot of retirees, after working, they have to end up going back to work again. Because what happens, uh, here's two issues. Their retirement plan, if the market goes down, they could possibly lose money. Or the second thing, they didn't, didn't have enough. Start using it, and you, once you liquidate that, you're done. So therefore, as part of financial planning, you want to make sure you safeguard that nest egg of yours. Make sure that if the market goes down, you don't lose. At the same time, make sure it has lifetime guarantee income. Again, these are new products that's hitting the industry, and you need to really explore that further because it's available today. You know, if you had $100,000 in traditional plan and you take 10000 a year and 10 year, you're out of money, right? Exactly. Well, imagine, what if I give you the same $100,000 and you get 10000 a year, but it'll last you until the day you kick the bucket? And if you don't use all the money, it goes to your family. That's what, what I mean by living too long. Okay. Shirley, what kind of product is that that would um, give you that A lot of, of product protection? today, they have what's called a guaranteed lifetime income that's coming out, whether it's an annuity or annuity. whether it's life. Um, mm -hmm. And I just had, I, just meant, I mean, my, I've seen what my clients, I've done for my clients for the past four or five years, and I'll be honest with you, sir, uh, several years ago when I talked about this and preached in front of folks, in front of the, even at the U.S. Capitol, People make joke, are you Rupert Murdoch? <laughs> you know, does it exist? Is it for real? And at that time, uh, it was difficult trying to explain and educate folks on what, why, uh, and then, but now, guess what? The media now backing me up, you know, there's Fox News, MSNBC, CNBC, Time Magazine, and there's books, and there's authors, and there's people going on financial. So it's now become a reality of these new generation of products that I'm not the only one talking about it. A lot of people talk about it. Okay. The other part would be, um, Anthony, you spoke about the women uh, programs at SBA has. How about for minorities? What programs are there in place? There are several minority programs, and one is the, the 8A business development program. And however, the individual, uh, in addition to being minority, must own and unconditionally control 51% of that company. And the SBA provides multitude of different types of tests to assure that that individual is in control of that company and not somebody else. In addition to that, for the business startup, whereas the SBA requires two years full-time in business, for a business startup, a minority can be self-certified as a small disadvantaged business. And, they, and then the, uh, if the individual is, is a woman, it's the woman-owned small business, and, uh, but that's for all women as well. And uh, so these are examples of programs available for, for, for minorities within these uh, for certification. But then again, one doesn't have to, even a minority doesn't necessarily have to be certified in, in any of those classes to be able <coughs> to pursue government contracting. By virtue of being a small business, there are many contracts in the millions that are set aside as a small business set aside. And many minorities overlook that contracting opportunity. Mm. <coughs> okay. these, are, these, are, these are called the set aside. Small business, small set, business aside. set aside. programs, okay. 
Um, we're gonna we're gonna take more questions just a little bit later. But I have I have a question. I I know in the old days, and I don't know if it's still this way, that SBA worked uh, very closely with banks. Is that still the case? And if so, how what how is that relationship? Built? Very good. Thank you for asking that. Within each district office of the Small Business Administration, and we have 68 district offices nationwide, we have a Lender Relations Specialist, LRS. And that Lender Relations Specialist is responsible for constantly training bankers that are already participating <coughs> in the 8A loan program to stay abreast with our products because banks turn over quite a lot yeah. or, and they, or they're always hiring new people in the commercial loan departments and so we're constantly training them. In addition to that, we try to recruit additional mm -hmm. banks. One of the biggest breakthroughs now is the classic community bank is a credit union. Oh. And, mm -hmm. and it's a natural alliance where credit unions financing small business owners, mm -hmm. especially when it's a one owner company. And so many credit unions now are becoming participants oh, in great. SBA's loan program. That's great. A misconception is that SBA is lending the program. Our loan programs are guarantees. It's a federal government guaranteeing to the bank a certain percentage of that loan. On real estate loans, it would be 50%. And, uh, but the bank is only financing 50% of the loan, so in essence, they have a 100% guarantee right. on a real estate loan. Right. On working capital, anywhere from 85 to 90% a guarantee in order to provide credit enhancement to the individual if they need that credit enhancement to obtain a small business loan. Right. Wow. Uh, we're going to take a short station break. We will be right back with more questions um, going to our expert panelists and uh, our business um, uh, team here will be asking those questions. So don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Hello and welcome. Skills to Pay the Bills is a show that provides information to everyday citizens, families, and businesses regarding the current economy and how to protect themselves. We have some exciting programming in the upcoming weeks featuring subject matter experts from the Small Business Administration who will share information and demystify the whole 8A certification process and set aside contracting for women, veterans, and minorities as well as provide education for small business owners. So I encourage you to watch Skills to Pay the Bills right here on Fairfax Public Access Channel 10 on Wednesdays, 1.30 a.m., Thursdays, 10 a.m., and Fridays, 7.30 p.m. For PG and Montgomery counties, please check your local cable listings. For more information, please feel free to visit www.sba.gov. And don't forget to watch Skills to Pay the Bills. Hi. For those of you who are just joining us, you are watching Skills to Pay the Bills and part two of our two-part series on risk management strategies for small business owners and their families. Uh, we're going to get right started with uh, questions. And we've got some burning questions here. So who's number one? I am. Ready. Uh I am Nevela Otley from the Otley Music School in Hyattsville, Maryland. And my question is, how do you protect a nonprofit, a 501c3 school? Um, it's been in existence for 40 years. How do you protect it from just getting the tuition and not dipping into your retirement and other things? Okay. Well, if you're looking at, um, from the business standpoint, as far as you know, not touching your money that you save aside to fund in something like that, uh, I believe that's where Mr. Uh, Anthony if I could be best answer that. You know, as far as uh, well, uh, I, I thought you wanted to address the retirement side. It's mm -hmm. that issue is a cash flow issue, and it's you you plan your cash flow, and there may be times where you have seasonal negative cash flow, and that's the time to borrow, and uh, and many people are adverse to borrowing, they think it's bad to borrow, and there's, in finance theories, there's called an M&M theory, and it's well known by formable institutions, and actually, 
Borrowing is a method of accelerating wealth and accumulation of wealth, provided you borrow at a reasonable level that you can service that debt. And so again, it comes down to planning, cash flow projections, and, and then backing that up with adequate financing, working capital, short-term financing, to finance those negative dips in your cash flow so that then you don't have to eat into your savings or your retirement. Thank you. That's really interesting. Uh, I, as you were giving that uh, response, I remember years ago when I was a little girl, I had an, an aunt who would borrow money and put it in her retirement. And we all thought she was nuts. She has money, we don't. You know, that's what she would do. She'd pay it back uh, within almost no time, but that was way back 30 some years ago, and that's what she would do. She would borrow money. And um, unlike a lot of people, they'd borrow the money and they'd go, go on a trip and do other things. She would take that money and fund her retirement. Remember I just talked a few minutes earlier, for those of you who missed it, about the leverage planning program? We're basically using the bank's money to create money with clients, because one side you've got a write-off happening, and the other side the money's growing. So over time, that's how you do it. I have tons and tons of business owners utilize that concept. I mean, they start buying small shop, next thing you know, they're buying more, they're buying this, that. It's because utilizing that very concept of what Mr. Anthony has said. So borrowing is Using not a bad thing. I mean, no, it's, it's it depends so on what you're going to, to do with it yes. on that end. Thank it you. accelerates wealth accumulation. I like that. Thank I you. like that. Our next question. Well, first of all, I will, I said, my name is Gail Hall. And first of all, I'm very interested in everything that you said tonight. Well, thank you. Uh, my question is, I, I have a one-woman show where I go out and make people laugh, because I think that's the healing for people. How do I contract myself out as the laugh doctor, the prescription maybe for hospitals, people who, are, who need to laugh again, who sit down and never laugh again? How do I become that one-woman business to contract myself to agencies and make people laugh again? That is a marketing problem. And, uh, and when I say a problem, it's not a bad thing, but it's, that's the issue. It's a marketing issue. And so you have to now get very creative on how do you promote yourself. First of all, this is a service. And so think of yourself now. You're a service company. And so, and then you're in professional services. And then your customers, you have to define your market. Your market are institutions. Mm -hmm. And then you have to ask yourself, what is the selective criteria in the culture of selection by these institutions so that you brand yourself appropriately? Mm -hmm. You want to become a known name Say within your market. Thank and now you. define That's the it. geographic confines of your market. Mm -hmm. and, and now within the geographic confines, take inventory own the market and one of the ways we teach our clients to own the market is just define the geographic confines take inventory who are your customers within that market and now those are your target customers and then get acquainted with each individual institution and who are they using right now and through research and even meeting with these folks are they happy with who they have right now and uh, there's, there's an old saying in business development, uh, no is never forever. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. no is mm -hmm. now, and, but that can change a week from now, three weeks from now, a month from now. And so you want to develop relationships with these institutions. And so this requires a comprehensive sales and marketing plan. There's different ways to promote yourself to these hospitals. For example, in your type of business, Publishing is one, okay. and uh, another is providing consultation, and, uh, and sometimes even uh, it's pro bono. The other is, let's say a hospital tells you, well, we're using ABC company, and we're really, really happy with them. Well, a novice will walk away and say, well, if, if, you, if you ever change your mind, think of me. No, what I've done when I was in my own business is I would want to know that must be a really good company then. Well, who are they? And, and I would go to that company and now seek business as a subcontractor. Mm. So your market 
is twofold. Not only the hospitals, but also the companies that are well entrenched with those hospitals. And so one easier way to get in there is to offer yourself as a subcontractor. There are only two ways, two ways a company can grow. One, hire more employees. Mm -hmm. Two, hire subcontractors. And many firms use a combination of both. Mm -hmm. And so they need subcontractors to grow. Okay. And so then you find out in the market, study the firms that are way ahead of you in doing what you're doing and find out who are the most successful ones. And now hitch your wagon to the most successful ones and you will grow with them. And then at the right moment, you will become a prime contractor. Thank you is, that, so is that what you meant earlier when you said about not trying to do everything yourself? Yes. You know, to try to, to branch and network. Yes. Together. There's a very good way to leverage yourself. And the way you leverage yourself, particularly if, if you're a one-person company, yeah. is you're good at what you do, then become a subcontractor. Mm -hmm. That's a lot easier than trying to get a direct contract. Mm -hmm. and, but make sure you're teaming yourself up with the appropriate company. They're successful and they pay their subcontractors and they're not gonna nickel dime you to death. Wow, thank you so much. Very good. Very good um, our next question. I think that's me. <laughs> you have so many uh, wonderful things to say that I now have 15 more questions. <laughs> My we don't have time for 15 more questions, Andrea. <laughs> My name is Reverend Andrea Lomboy. I have two businesses. One is the Congregational Health Resource, which is a for-profit where I use my consulting skills to help congregations become healthier. And I also have a nonprofit that I, well, I hope to move towards a nonprofit. I'm the executive director for that. It's Healthy Congregations, and we provide an online resource. I have a number of questions, and how would you best suggest that I leverage the different certifications that you had suggested? I currently have the small woman and minority owned business, the SWAM certification, and I'm also a veteran. Do I need to get a veteran quote unquote certification, or do, do my qualifications as a veteran suffice? And how would you suggest that I best leverage those to obtain? Um, you know, further assistance, developing partnerships, developing a service line and products, et cetera, to offer to churches and pastors to help them to become healthier. Very good. And being a veteran, you would appreciate the term landmines. When yes. you <laughs> told me you have two companies, well, profit and nonprofit, that in itself is a landmine. Why? Because to get these types of certifications, you must be in business full time. That means it's one, yeah, company. one company, but let me show you how to solve that problem. Okay. And actually, <laughs> and it'll be really good because it'll create synergy between your nonprofit and your, and your for-profit. There's a new type of corporate entity that's been approved by Congress. It's called a benefits corporation. And imagine a sociologically oriented nonprofit. <laughs> that's now allowed to be for profit. You can be an LLC, you can be a corporation, you're a benefits corporation, meaning that it's a company for profit, but is typically doing what nonprofits do. And that by merging your two companies together, now you have one company. I've always and been told to keep them completely separate and and well, if, if it's a it's a challenge. Challenge. Well, yes. I think before, because mm -hmm. this type of entity didn't exist. Mm -hmm. And so and there are a lot of tax advantages now for this benefits corporation. And uh, it is permitted in Virginia, and it is also recognized in the state of Maryland. And uh, now you have one company. Mm -hmm. And so, and you're woman owned. And, uh, and so you can pursue now being WSB certified immediately. Mm -hmm. But first, bring them together, because you've got to have one company. Are you a minority? Yes. Okay, now, you've been in business how long? Since 2007. Excellent, you meet the two-year test, full-time, mm -hmm. I presume, and now you're eligible to apply for 8A. Okay. And uh, so, and the interesting thing is, when you, you are approved as an 8A company, you're also considered small disadvantaged business. Okay. And so if there's contracts set aside for SDB, your eligible to go after those. Contracts set aside for WSB, you're eligible to go after those. And, uh, or for 8A. Now, in veteran, however, you have to be service disabled. 
Are you service disabled? No. Here's how you take care of that. You're a veteran, and a lot of veterans like to do business with veterans and yes. like to align themselves with veterans. And there are several veteran-oriented agencies that will introduce you to other veteran companies. Mm -hmm. So what you do then is you seek out through these agencies a service disabled business owned by service a business owned by service disabled veteran and create a strategic alliance mm -hmm. or a joint venture mm -hmm. and um, and then now pursue together business in your line of business that is set aside for service disabled uh, veterans the benefit to that veteran owned company is by you aligning them, yourself with them now you have greater capacity yes. to perform on larger contracts Thank you, wow. that's awesome. Thanks that's really good. Our time is up, and we want to thank our panelists for the expertise and information that they have been willing to share with us. Uh, however, our big surprise for today is this, that Anthony Ruiz and other officials from the Small Business Administration have agreed to work with me and our regular host in providing information and education on everything you ever wanted or needed to know about doing business with Small Business Administration particularly government contracting opportunities through the 8A certification program or other programs and services that are offered through SBA. So check your cable television guide to make sure you don't miss a single segment. We also give special thanks to our small business owners and community observers for their participation and especially for those great questions. If you have any comments about today's show or perhaps you would like to be a guest on Skills to Pay the Bills, simply email me at skillstorock at gmail.com and tell me a little bit about yourself. Thank you for watching Skills to Pay the Bills. Bye-bye.